Hi, we're back to continue to talk about home safety for elderly parents. We'll talk more about chronic diseases and optimism and the use of canes and walkers and some assistive devices for elderly parents. I'm Pamela D. Wilson, caregiver, expert, advocate, and speaker. I am your host and your instructor for this module. As always, let's start with the subject of housekeeping. I use the term elderly parent or elderly parents for the person for whom you are providing care. Outline slides are in the section, print them off, follow along with me and take notes. Let's talk about the objectives of chronic disease and health diagnoses that contribute to falls. At the end of this part, you should be able to identify health diagnoses that you may not realize and habits that you may realize that result in falls and you'll also be able to talk to medical providers and parents about issues that can contribute to these falls. In this part in particular, we're talking about fall risk and creative solutions. You should be able to recognize protective behaviors, including ending excuses by parents for not participating in safe behaviors. I'll show you how to research some creative solutions and I wanna increase the awareness of the long-term effects of non-fatal injuries because they do happen. Chronic disease accounts for more than 40% of US healthcare spending. Shocking, but beginning as early as age 40, at least 50% of people have multiple health conditions that we call chronic diseases, age 40. Doesn't that seem young to you to have so many health issues? At age 30, this is where it starts. Unless we're proactive, unless we walk, exercise, our bodies begin losing physical abilities, strength, and muscle mass. Based on what we've learned, what do you know happens next? We age. And physical weakness leads to that frail elderly syndrome we were talking about. The connection between chronic disease and falls in older adults, not highly talked about. Conditions like poor vision, poor hearing result in falls. We'll talk more about this. We'll also review a lot of the most common conditions that result in falls so that you're aware of these. Health conditions just don't show up overnight. They begin slowly in our younger years and they grow into significance until we have no choice but to pay attention to them in our 50s, 60s and beyond because they affect our daily quality of life. We know this until it happens, it is not real. For most people, the risk of an undiagnosed condition is not great enough to encourage self-protective behavior. I wish it was. Let's go back to talking about the coronavirus as an example. Since now we are very familiar, probably more familiar than we want to be with the virus and the effects for people with chronic disease. For a long time, younger and middle-aged adults didn't believe that that virus was a health risk. So what did they do? Went out in public, transmitted the virus to people in their families, parents and grandparents, who became seriously ill. Now we take it more seriously. Now we are all taking proactive measures so that we're not spreading it, we're not transmitting it, and heaven forbid, we're not getting the virus. Let's look at another typical example. For a long time, people who drove cars, they didn't want to wear seatbelts because that risk of being injured in a car accident was not real. What do most of us do today? We get in the car, we grab for that seatbelt, and we put it on without even thinking about it. Everyone, every single person can choose to reduce risks by participating in protective behaviors. Relative to the coronavirus, we know what these are. Hand washing, sneezing and coughing into tissues or the sleeve of a shirt, not touching our face with our hands. Others, taking vitamins, exercising, wearing a seatbelt, participating in health screenings like bone density tests, colonoscopies, and keeping our vaccinations up to date. If you watch that news surrounding the coronavirus, 
you know that there were populations that were talked about as being disproportionately affected. But do you know what that means? These populations include and continue to include individuals with chronic diseases like diabetes, heart condition, being overweight, people who don't go to the doctor for annual checkups, meaning people that don't have a primary care physician. A lot of people during the coronavirus wanted to contact a doctor, but they didn't have one because they never went to the doctor. We as a society cannot afford not to become more educated about health. If we want to minimize the effect of health concerns and viruses, it really is up to us to do this. There's no choice, it has to be us. As we know by now, good personal hygiene is one of the many steps to remain healthy and to be proactive about self-care because these proactive behaviors can protect us against unexpected events and chronic disease. There is that hassle factor though. It's what makes us do it or refuse to do it. And again, it goes back to that question, why does it take a major issue like the coronavirus to get our attention? It's partly the reason that we have this idea of what's called unrealistic optimism. Unrealistic optimism is when we believe that an event is less likely to happen to us, even though we don't have any facts to substantiate why we believe that. Optimism is positive when it supports self-esteem and positive results, but being overly optimistic poses harm when we and our elderly parents underestimate the potential for illness and injury and an adverse event happening. For example, caregivers experience high levels of stress from caring for elderly parents. This is proven, it's researched, the reality that being a caregiver at some point, most caregivers will wear down physically and emotionally. Now in the early stages of caregiving when it's mostly social, you're probably not gonna notice it. It's not until you've been that caregiver for five, 10, 15 years that you feel exhausted and you have health issues. That future exhaustion and health issues, that is similar to people who have health issues that start in their 30s and 40s, but not until 20, 30 years later, when they're in their 50s and 60s, do they notice it. Caregivers sacrifice health and well being to care for others. Your goal is not to be that caregiver who needs care in five, 10, or 20 years because you didn't take care of your health. If that happens and you know this, you have intentionally placed yourself in a situation where your children will be caring for you. So think about it. Are you creating a situation today? by not taking care of yourself, that will have your children caring for you when you are older. It's likely that if you're a caregiver for an elderly parent, they created that situation for you. So what is it? What's preventing you from being more proactive about your health? Let's talk about walkers, canes, and falls. We know by now that falls can be reduced by preventative behaviors. Although research confirms elderly adults refuse to use walkers or canes even when they have them sitting in their home. There is a sense of a loss of dignity associated with this. The elderly feel that canes and walkers are not relevant. They don't or refuse to understand the fall risks and the consequences of not using the canes and walkers. So grab your pens, here are some reasons cited in a study by Luz, L-U-Z. For the reasons that elderly parents don't use walkers, what do they say? I don't always need it. Oh, I hold on to other things like the furniture or walls. I forget to use it. I forgot where I left that thing. Ah, using a walker makes me feel old. You know, it's really too big. It's too heavy, it's too bulky to put in the car. Why would I take it with me? You know, I leave it where it is. It's not always handy for me. 
I just don't like it. Let's be honest. <laughs> Most of the reason is I just don't like it. The vast majority of adults in the study believed that using a cane or a walker would lessen the likelihood that they would have a fall. But still, you know what? They refused to use them. That belief of, I think it can prevent a fall, but I just don't like it, persisted in 75% of these older people who were surveyed, even after they had a fall. They knew it was good for them and they still refused to do it. What is it about that? Is that not enough to just drive you crazy? Well, here's part of the reason. Falls with canes and walkers happen because of incorrect use. Anybody can buy a cane and a walker without instructions from a physical therapist. Do you see your elderly parent or other people walking around and chasing a walker? So chasing a walker is a body position where a person is leaning forward, arms are outstretched, that walker is one to two feet in front of the body of the person. That alone increases the likelihood of a fall. So if you think of walking a dog, untrained dogs are walking in front of their owner, they're pulling the leash, they're pulling on the owner, but a well-trained dog is at the side of the owner walking with a loose leash. That proper stance for using a walker is not two feet in front of the body. It is the walker frames the body. So the walker is on the left front and right of the body, person lifts or rolls the walker forward and then steps the body into the walker and keeps repeating that action. Using a cane is the same thing. If you imagine you put the cane in your hand on the good side of your body and so when you step, you take a step with the bad leg forward and the cane forward to support your body. You keep moving the cane and the weak leg forward. Here's the other idea of why elderly parents say, I just don't like it. it. I'm not like them. The elderly do not want to spend time with people who use walkers and wheelchairs because they don't want to be like them. It goes back to the social identity theory. They don't want to be viewed as physically weak and being a fall risk, even though they are. When the elderly refuse or don't connect physical weakness to frailty syndrome and falls, we as the caregivers have to repeat it even if it's 20 times, even if it's 40 times to make it relevant to them. That is important. So let's look at some creative solutions for, I don't like it. Based on discussions in the course, we know that elderly parents don't want to be viewed as being like or having the behaviors of old people. That's the social identity theory. This denial of age, frailty, and why being physically active is good for us can be illustrated by a parent who doesn't want to go to a senior center. Your parent will say, I'm not like those old people. Even though your parent at 95 is probably older than most of those people there, so being open-minded and curious for a moment, what do you think the alternatives to using a cane or a walker might be? Well, the obvious one, or at least it should be obvious by now, is physical exercise and activity to strengthen the body. So using a cane and walker is not needed. Beyond this, another option. So look at the people in this picture. Do you have any idea what they're holding? It is tracking poles, T-R-E-K-K-I-N-G. Trekking poles are a way to support the body during exercise and walking, and it increases safety on uneven or hilly terrain. So if an elderly parent looks negatively at a cane or a walker, would they use a tracking pole? That's pretty hip. Younger people use tracking poles, not most older people. If they do that, you definitely want to make a doctor's appointment, get an evaluation by a physical therapist who can show them the appropriate use of the tracking poles. If your elderly parent says, heck no, no tracking poles, no cane, no walker, 
do the same thing. Request an order for a physical therapy appointment. Have that therapist talk to your parents about the consequences of falls, about the consequences of leaving home to move to a care community, and seeing if they would be willing to participate in exercises. So let's talk about non-fatal accidental injuries. So these are injuries that happen that don't cause immediate, immediate death. Statistics, more than 80% of medically attended non-fatal injuries don't result in hospitalization. So you may fall, you may go to the doctor, return back home. Nearly 75% of older adults seeking care from an emergency room still are treated and released without being hospitalized. The important thing is for aging adults, these non-fatal injuries can lead to future hospitalizations and more health complications. Non-fatal injuries like falls, becoming overexerted, motor vehicle accident, burn, cut, you bump your head, fracture, difficulty grasping items, chair walking, the results of these non-fatal injuries can be significant because many of them lead to lower physical activity, decreased physical strength, and more weakness. Because again, we're going back to the idea that I have a fall so I limit my physical activity. The most significant predictor of a fall for the elderly is a previous fall. Findings from research confirm that an initial injury may be the beginning of a cumulative process of declining health and functional capacity. I've seen this in my clients. Prevention for non-fatal injuries is so, so very important. Now I wanna tell you a story about a client of mine named Warren. Warren was super physically active. Warren had a diagnosis called bipolar behavior. And that resulted in Warren's moods being kind of up and down. He would get very anxious. But what he did for being anxious was very good. He would go walk. And I mean, he would walk for hours, for miles. But on the other hand, Warren needed help in the home because he didn't eat very well and he would forget to take his medications. And even Warren admitted, I don't know why I take those. I don't feel like they do any good for me. Well, very sad story. For Warren, Warren would get into these patterns of not taking his medications even though the caregivers came and would leave them out and would leave meals for him. So one evening, the caregiver got to the home and the door was unlocked and came in. They were looking for Warren and they couldn't find him. And they eventually found Warren in his bathtub. Warren had gone out for a walk, came back, turned on the faucets, and got in the tub and the water was so hot that it scalded his skin and he couldn't get out of the tub. He physically could not get out of the tub. We called the paramedics, the paramedics came. Warren was unintentionally burned over 70% of his body. Unintentional injury, didn't think about it. Got into that tub, went down, couldn't get back up, sat in that boiling water for hours until the caregiver came. Warren passed away. These things happen to elderly parents. Are they one in a million? Yes. Because I have done this for 20 years, because I've had so many experiences, varying experiences, almost every experience that you could imagine, I talk about these because I don't want you to be that one in a million caregiver who has this freak accident that happens to your elderly parent because they don't think any of this applies to them because they don't think they need to walk or take their medications or eat well or exercise or do any of this. We have to be that 20 time mention of that broken record to save our elderly parents from these types of unintentional injuries and to save ourselves from thoughts of, oh my gosh, I should have said something and I didn't. I don't want you to be there. These webinar programs help you avoid that and help you to take better care for elderly parents. So a summary, consistent health habits we know and physical activity are the best prevention against chronic disease. If I've said it once, I have now said it 20 times. And the challenge is that 
we have to convince our elderly parents to be proactive and to deciding that to deciding that being proactive outweighs enjoying risky habits that we may have engaged in in all of our lives. I'm Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, advocate, and speaker. It is my pleasure to be with you for these programs. Please go back, listen to them again, look at your notes, take more notes, learn from these. And even if all of these situations are not relevant to you today, at some point they can and they will be relevant. So stick with this program, keep going, don't give up. There's a lot of good information coming, a lot of helpful information coming. It's my pleasure to be with you. I will see you in the next webinar.